joining from Rome, Italy, where I've been based for the last three years. As you heard in the introduction, I was formerly a student at Delhi University. I finished my studies about uh, a decade ago, so that's quite a while back. But I think that education has really stood me in very good stead. And I find it an amazing um, endeavor that all of you are um, able to refresh your skills and acquire uh, perhaps new exciting perspectives on um, how this space of development is evolving and this concept of development, particularly as we see disaster and climate risks are rising. And I think it's important to highlight that um, Despite all the um, density around this topic, particularly in terms of the knowledge that exists in this space, it's quite evident that um, climate impacts those that are poor and vulnerable disproportionately. So this is an undisputed fact, and that's why a lot of international agencies are accelerating their efforts in this space so that no one gets left behind. And that's also the motto of the Global Sustainable Development Goals. So these goals are driving a lot of global development work, not just at the international level, but also at the country level and hopefully at community level when governments take charge of these mandates. So um, with this precursor in mind, I would like to start by um, doing a short um, polling with you all online. So I'm sharing my screen now and I'm going to present the first slide. This is the first one. So I'm going to present it. So the question that I want to understand from all of you, and this is going to be interesting because it will come in the form of a word cloud, is what is your motivation for attending this lecture today? So what are you trying to get out of it? And you can enter your response there directly. Yes, and risk is a multifaceted concept, really, because there are so many different types of risks that exist in the world. Yes, it's diverse. This is true. And also it affects people in different ways. So the diversity is not just in the type of risk. Tech responds to emergency, yes. Resilient development. So yes, all very valid. I try to see if there are any trends because there are only four responses. So that's why there will be no trend, but usually there will be some bigger theme that emerges. Yes, to get new information. I guess this is a good start. Yes, I guess the role of human beings in in this whole disaster and climate risk situation anthropocene yes so i think this is quite a good start to be honest um and i mean of course we can keep going with this but i think it's nice to understand a little bit of the perspectives with which all of you are participating and also to understand that your knowledge is fairly advanced already in this space because if you're able to think about planetary boundaries and, and so on, I think that you already might know a lot in terms of the science that exists out there. Come back to my um, my presentation now that I understand a little bit more of, uh, of what you are all coming to this with. Good, now that we had an understanding of the background of where you all are coming from, it helps me to um, understand what the sort of overarching background and your your sort of perspectives around this are. Um, so I guess I, I would like to start by explaining that in the global arena, there are a lot of different frameworks that exist for management of disaster and climate risk. And these are projected on the screen. For example, the Paris Agreement now will be succeeded by the next one from COP in Glasgow. We have the new urban agenda. We have the 2030 SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals, and we have the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction. And I guess it's important to recall that all of these agreements and frameworks have some historical precedent, which are in the gray. And the idea in the sector now is um, a transformation of the understanding of holistic development. And that is by applying this understanding of risk management in a systemic way. Because um, there, there is more and more um, uh, consensus that a lot of risks are intersecting and overlapping. And that's also because of complexity that exists in the world. So when we look at different issues, for example, if we look at um, a famine in Mozambique or in um, Madagascar, which is active right now, 
we then have to understand that the famine is a function of perhaps some climate event because the drought has been prolonged and therefore the crops have not been able to be cultivated appropriately. There's also another risk layer of COVID which has pushed the country back into greater levels of poverty and unemployment. There is also um, other vulnerabilities that exist um, also in terms of uh, social and economic factors. And when we layer these one on top of the other, we get a very complex picture. And that's why risk management has systemic perspectives. And this is also a reason why a lot of the interventions that are being projected for, for example, climate or disaster have elements like community resilience building, taking into consideration gender vulnerabilities and also um, other factors that might um, enhance or amplify risk, but may not be the direct factor of that risk. For example, the climate cannot be altered, but if resilience of communities for the climate can be altered, then their response to particular disaster events might be better. And they might have less difficulty in recovering from crises. They may even be able to mitigate their own risks against the crisis through community interventions and so on. So um, I think with this understanding, we can think a little bit about framing risk, complexity and technology. The sector that I work in is technology. So the idea around my work, and this is also driving some of the UN's work around emergency management, is a sectoral intervention. So different UN agencies, depending upon the sector that is at risk, are in charge of management of those risks and crises in countries as the situations arise. For example, for emergency telecommunication, the World Food Programme where I'm based is the key agency that is the coordinating entity around this. So in my specific programme area, which is preparedness for risks, the way that that works is that a national government would approach us and say we need support for emergency telecommunication readiness. Can you assist us with a simulation, a training, uh, preparedness planning through policy interventions and infrastructure assessment and a range of other menu card items. So in that sense, we then respond by, for example, myself deploying physically to the country to help in doing this type of work or even remotely providing some desk related support. It depends on what the situation is. So I think once you sort of understand that, that perspective of um, where am I coming from, I think this, this diagram will also start to make a bit of sense. And we try to put community intervention at the heart of every activity because ultimately the communities are the ones that are in, are the ones that are most vulnerable really to disasters and climate risks. And the, uh, the higher the adaptive capacity, that is the capacity to respond to these type of complex shocks, the better even the country will be to bounce back from different types of crises. If the community as a corollary is not able to respond and absorb these type of shocks, that might also result in pushing the country into an even deeper level of poverty and also um, a lot of challenges structurally, which the country will have to contend with for many years to come. So, for example, when Cyclone Pam struck in one of the small island nations in the Pacific, which is a small place in, um, in Vanuatu, really, where a lot of the de devastation happened, the country was actually pushed back by decades in their development progress, not just financially, but also in terms of loss of life, infrastructure, and so on. And that recovery process to actually get back the gains lost is something that they are still contending with years after that cyclone has struck and caused that damage. So this is why there is also a business case really for preparedness and the value of technology is also quite strong in this. And I will highlight that in um, my forthcoming slides. So these feedback loops actually illustrate the fact that all the, all the systems that exist in a country, like whether it's social, political, economic, they all are very complexly interconnected. And when a disaster strikes, 
also perhaps enhanced by climate factors in a changing climate disasters are emerging more frequent and severe. The result is that the country as a whole experiences shocks in sectors wide ranging. So it's not like just um, the sector of infrastructure is having a lot to contend with with disasters, but it's also um, social and economic factors that push back the country in their development progress by many, many years. And also the, the poorest, which, are, which is the sad reality, are the ones that are marginalized and affected the worst from these type of um, disaster events. So I think um, that vulnerability is amplified the more um, the more vulnerable a community is uh, so i think this is a, a double bind which um, is um, a cause for a lot of concern in this space so why is disaster and and climate risk management crucial for building community resilience and i think that um, this goes back a lot to um, this concept of community capital which um, is actually drawing a lot from natural capital because nature for a lot of communities provides livelihood, it provides resources, it provides food, it provides even water. So um, these critical resources actually feed into human development in countries. And then of course it fuels social interaction, cultural developments, built environment which also um, is uh, connected a lot to the natural environment and finally the economic but unfortunately what we see is that the economic tends to be the bedrock which has replaced natural in common understanding and this is where there are a lot of challenges because if we start with economic capital and do not consider the natural capital there is a big gap then in the type of interventions, the type of social interactions, the type of cultural capital even that we have, and even our built environment differs a lot. So I think this conceptualization of understanding that the community really draws its capital from nature is quite important to um, return back to whenever we are planning development interventions. And community is actually consisting of many factors, really, because it's not just community equals to village, which is quite a rudimentary understanding. We have to think of resilience at multiple levels. As we see here, it's about individual resilience, household resilience, community engagements at um, a local level, local governments, national governments, organizations, not just humanitarian, but all across the board and also regional collaboration and finally global collaboration that creates an understanding of um, a much more wider community. So um, I think when we consider, for example, these type of overarching huge risks at a mammoth scale, like climate and disaster, we need to go beyond national boundaries and understand that these events have the planetary significance so the interventions that we plan at country level are well and good, but it needs to plug into those global interventions and also take inspiration from different countries which have been able to develop successful risk management programs over the years so that there is that um, learning exchange. And the truth of the matter is that there will be winners and losers in this climate game. And the reason why is because um, depending on positioning really, and it's all about the positioning of where countries are like physically located, that their temperature and other daily factors in, um, in living life will be altered significantly. Like for example, I was reading some projection studies in um, India and, and the idea at least behind this study is to investigate what 50 years down the line could look like. And the findings are actually quite startling because the heat will rise a lot. And because of this intense heat, it might become inhospitable at some point, but it also might require a regular use of air conditioners, which as you know, are quite expensive. And um, it might not be easily accessible to everyone. So we see these heat waves that are already coming quite severely. But in the years to come, if we have a very serious warming scenario, which is unchecked, it might result in inhospitable conditions. And then one also has to think of the fact that 
whilst on one side we have the heat rising, on the other side there's also an increased incidence of flooding. So in delta regions and coastal zones, a lot of the infrastructure and communities that reside there are at quite high risk, depending on what the scenario of the climate will be like. So in that sense, I think it's whilst there will be some losers in that sense, there might be some winners as well.